Hi, everyone. And thank you so much for joining me today. It is October 29th, 2020. And we're going to be discussing the October surprise and why, if the GDP was just the biggest and the best in history, why did Wall Street lose ground? Why is Wall Street down 2,000 points since mid-October? And um, why are the Dow futures pointing towards more weakness in stocks? I'll be right with you. All right, this meeting is uh, being recorded. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the October surprise and also the surprise that the October surprise actually caused stock to go down. So I'm gonna share the screen so I can show you a few things. And um, I'm gonna give you the overview and then I'll open it up for questions, uh, you know, as after we go through the overview. So a couple things I wanna show you. First thing is that we uh, just had one of the best GDP reports in history. Of course, the current president took no time at all in screaming that from the rooftops. And it was the biggest and the best in the history of our country, not even close. And next year is gonna be fantastic. Now, this is common. I'm not picking on the current, the incumbent at all because it wouldn't matter who was in office. Anybody would be saying that. And by the way, you kind of heard crickets when the second quarter GDP was announced because that was the worst in history. So let's take a, a closer look at the GDP report so we can put it in context. All right, so back to this report. So again, we had a 33.1% increase that's annualized. And the second quarter was a 31.4% uh, decrease. And the first quarter was a 5% decrease. This was the worst in history. So this was kind of more a bounce on the off the bottom for context. Now, what's gonna happen the rest of the year? Well, the rest of the year is expected to have about a 4% contraction. So a lot of people are hearing that we're in a bull market and they assume that means we're out of the recession, but that's not the case. We are in a bull market in the middle of a recession. And by the way, that's not that abnormal. That's kind of normal way that recessions go. And the reason for that is that no politician ever wants to admit that we're in trouble. And of course, the minute there's any sign of good news, they're gonna scream it from the rooftops. That's the way politics goes. It doesn't matter if it's Democrat, Republican, or pigeons, it would be the same. They wanna tout their strengths, they wanna downplay their weaknesses. But it's important for you to understand because the price is too high of being ignorant. Why is the price too high of being the group? Well, in the dot-com recession, NASDAQ lost 78% and took 15 years to come back to even. Now, of course, NASDAQ stocks are higher than ever, but if you have 15 years of your life losing 78% of your wealth, then all kinds of trouble comes from that. Your credit score is bad. Uh, you might have you know, all kinds of things that are no longer available to you. And you might even have a bunch of creditors that are trying to eat you alive. In the Great Recession, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 55%. Now, a lot of people just say, oh, well, buy and hold, and it always comes back. But that's not a financial plan. If you're using the bull markets to recover losses, then that's not a wealth strategy. That's riding the Wall Street roller coaster. And what you need to do now is ask yourself how you felt in March. And if you felt like you were worried or you had lost a lot of money and most people lost 35% or more, that's a red flag that you need to get a better plan. There is a better plan. There are plans that it well diversified, keep enough safe, and they actually earned gains in both of the last two recessions and outperformed the bull markets in between. Not only because you're building upon a good foundation of wealth and you didn't lose half, but also because we add in hots. So we add in things that we think are going to be super hot and we underweight things that we think are not going to be super hot. So right now, what are we doing? We're overweighting technology, underweighting financials, overweighting um, biotechnology, 
underweighting the value funds, which no longer are a value because stocks are still pretty close to their all-time high. And normally a value fund would pay you a dividend and you're not getting that because many companies have been forced to either cut or suspend their dividends. So we're gonna dig into the details of it, but I wanted to give you the cliff notes at the beginning. The big question is, are we gonna have a Santa rally? And the answer is probably not. And the reason for that is that even though this quarter is one for the history books and does look good, but is technically a bounce off the bottom, that is already priced in. And what we're seeing even instead is that at the little tiniest sign of weakness, stock prices go down. So most of the insiders know what's coming. What happened in between February and March when the stocks tanked, it wasn't 401k providers, it wasn't Main Street, it was the insiders. We had the biggest exodus that I've ever seen. Uh, Bob Iger immediately retired as CEO. Uh, Bill Gates retired, the, uh, the Hewlett Packard CEO, who was a woman, retired. So we had all of these Wall Streeters retiring, taking as much as they could and saying sayonara. So, um, it's really important for you to know the term, which is called gap down. So let's take a look at what that means. I'm gonna share the screen. So if we look over here now, we can see that the Dow was slightly up today. Now for news of the biggest GDP report in history, if it was really exciting, then you would have seen the Dow rally. That, 100 points up after 2000 point drop plus drop since mid October is really not anything at all. So let's take a look. And again, markets are always forward thinking. So if we look at the Dow and we see where it is today, what we see are a couple of things. The first thing is you can see that it was much higher February 19th when it hit its high. So it was over 3, 000, about 3,000 points higher. But what's really interesting here is that a lot of the losses of late have come since mid-February when it was 2,000 points higher. So really important for you to understand that these kind of things happen while you're sleeping. And if you wait for the headlines, it's too late. Look, I mean, I, I wanna go back to that chart real quickly because you can also see another thing there. So again, if we click on the year, look at that downturn. So most people, this was the fastest that the Wall Street had ever gone from a bull market to a bear market. And imagine dropping from 29,000 and change to 18,000 and change. So 11,000 points before you really even knew what was happening. Most people were calling our offices by mid-March and this was March 23rd. So again, you have to stay ahead of the head headlines. Now here's another thing that happens. So I'm gonna take a look at the Apple stock because Apple reported earnings after the markets closed. And you can see here that Apple uh, closed at $115 a share, but in after hours trading, it was already down almost $5. That's called a gap down. Okay, so it happens while you're sleeping and you wake up in the morning and all of a sudden the prices are different. So again, now is the time when you want to be rebalancing. So again, these are the cliff notes and I'll go through all the data so you can see that this is supported by science, not just some whimsical uh, crystal ball reading by me. But the bottom line is that I, are we going to have a Santa rally? It's already priced in as prices. And in fact, at the smallest sign of weakness, which we've already seen with Apple, and Apple had decent earnings. They just had a slight bit lower income report. And that's why people have started to sell off. Now, what is tomorrow going to look like? Well, we can look real quickly at the Dow futures. And what we can see there is that it's already looking like it would be a down day again tomorrow. See that Exxon is cutting jobs, Apple's earnings were weaker than people expected. Uh, those sort of things the market doesn't like because it's already priced in. So 
again, now is the time to do your rebalancing. You wanna make sure that you know what is safe. You wanna make sure that you have a percent equal to your age safe. We are overweighting safe because we are still in a recession. It hasn't been declared over yet. So we're in a bull market in a recession. I'll share some statistics with you about the great recession and the dot-com recession. So you can see that this is not Abby normal. It's quite normal for this to happen. Um, and I want you to know that I give you instructions on how to rebalance two places. So I'm gonna show you those two places now, and then we'll dig into the data. So the first thing you can do, and both of these places, by the way, are free. So you could go to nataliepace.com forward slash blog. And the first blog that you're gonna to come to, if you, you know, if you do it in the next day or two, is the annual rebalancing blog. And there are six tips on how to rebalance your nest egg. And there are free websites, uh, web apps that you can use to mock up and personalize your own sample nest egg pie chart. Also, I wanna remind you that now through Halloween, the ABCs of money is free. So do download that even if you own a previous edition because this one has been mocked up to include pandemic specific strategies. Also, what's hot and what's safe change every year. So whenever there's a significant event like a pandemic, I have to update it so you know what's safe in a pandemic. I also have to update it so you'll know which countries might be potentially the hottest or which industries might be potentially the hottest or what can you do if all your value funds aren't paying dividends and they're trading too high to be called a value. So do, and again, students, uh, friends, family, early stocking stuffers, early Christmas gifts, it's only available for two more days as a free freebie. So this is a good time to do it. All right, so let's dig in to some of the data and we're gonna get started on this. So the first thing that you should know is that, I'm gonna show you if I can a few charts and then we'll come back to this one. The first thing is on the safe side. So bonds are illiquid and negative yielding. Those should be two words that don't sound very good because in a normal recession, bonds would be buoyant. They would help to keep your money safe and they would pay you a yield. They would pay you interest. That's not happening in this recession. So in the dot-com recession, bonds did spectacular. They really, really helped to make earn gains. And same thing in the dot-com recession, not as spectacular, but good. This time around, negative yielding and illiquid. What does illiquid mean? It means that if you own a bond or potentially even a bond fund, there may not be a buyer on the other side of the table if you so choose to sell it. Or if you do wanna sell it and there are fewer buyers that wanna buy it, they'll say, well, if you paid a thousand, maybe I'll give you 800. That still might be a good deal because of the amount of leverage that's going on. So what's safe? We spend one full day on what's safe in the retreat. I have an entire section on what's safe in the ABCs of money. I strongly recommend that you read it. And if you're interested in reattending a retreat, there's a good reason to both for what's safe and what's hot and to use it as your annual rebalancing time. So back to this chart. So as you can see in this chart, US corporate bonds are highly illiquid. And by the way, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, the leading blue chip index that they say, self-proclaimed, I call it the leading bailout index. Guess how many companies in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, there are only 30, were received a bond bailout in March or between you know, the bonds, the bonds been bought up over the past few months about every one. So the Dow Jones Industrial Average is highly over leveraged. Again, more than half of the S&P 500 is at or near junk bond status. And that includes a lot of banks and financial services companies. I'll show you those charts in just a moment. Okay, so US corporate bonds 
not very liquid. Gold, very liquid. S&P 500 stocks, very liquid. Short-term treasuries, very liquid. One to three year, that's very short-term. So if you are going to own any type of bond, it should be short-term and it should be very credit worthy. You're not really getting paid for those short-term treasuries, by the way. And the shorter term, not as much of a risk of going down in value, but the midterm and the long-term, especially if you're in a fund, the fund itself can go down in value. So you don't get paid and you lose money on it. Um, money market funds have redemption gates and liquidity fees. Most people are in a money market fund, even at their bank. So you have to read the fine print on all of your paper products. And that's why hard assets, safe income producing hard assets that you purchase for a good price could hold their value much, much better. Of course, in today's world, you have to think of what would be income producing in a world in a pandemic or a post pandemic world. Sorry. So on the safe side, again, that's tricky. That's not supposed to go down in value. And if a bond is negative yielding and at risk of principal loss and illiquid, that's not a definition of safety. That's a definition of risk. So um, if you would like additional information from another expert, I interviewed the chief fixed income strategist of Charles Schwab. Her name is Kathy Jones a few months ago. She says basically the same thing, but she, you know, she gives you other things as well. I strongly recommend that you, if you haven't already checked it out, do check it out. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Natalie Pace. I'll show you that in just a second and um, you'll be able to find it there. Free, no cost. Okay, so that's the liquidity data chart. Now, a lot of people don't realize that this was even happening back in December of 2019. So here you can see, and this is a chart that was put together by Bloomberg with a bunch of data from world.org and other companies too. So the Dow Jones, as I said, the Dow Jones industrial average is not doing well. Corporate bonds in terms of liquidity, people are not as interested in these highly leveraged, very high debt, very slow growth companies that have allowed themselves to fall to the lowest rung of uh, investment grade. US T-bills are more liquid, but the short-term ones, not the mid or the long-term ones. Gold is very liquid and um, S&P 500 stocks. All right, let's look at the next chart. I already told you that many banks are at or near junk bond status. So BBB is the lowest rung of investment grade. Look at all these banks that are there. Wells Fargo had to dramatically cut its dividend by 80%. Capital One cut its dividend by 75%. Um, you can see that JP Morgan and Bank of America are slightly higher rated. This is, AAA is the best and BB, if, so if BBBs fall down one to BB, then they are junk bonds. And that leads me to our financial services companies and here you can see that we have a junk bond there, MSCI, Morgan Stanley Securities. And a lot of the brokerages are, again, the lowest rung of investment grade. By comparison, BlackRock, which owns iShares, is uh, just one rung be, uh, below the highest grade. So AAA is the highest grade. Asset bubbles. Now, the interesting thing here, again, you're here, oh, stock market is at an all-time high. Oh, uh, home prices are, are so great. Um, you know, homeowners are doing so well. And then on the other hand, you'll hear uh, housing prices are unaffordable. What you're not hearing is that everything is overpriced. We have asset bubbles. And in fact, Jerome Powell at Jackson Hole admitted that in the 21st century, we have periods of financial instability that end our bull markets. So at, when I tell you that the dot-com recession, 78% losses, the Great Recession, 55% losses, 
that's not a normal recession. That's more like a great depression. And this current cycle is no different. And let me show you the asset bubble chart so you can see what I'm talking about. Let's we'll look at a few other indicators as well. So as you can see, um, unemployment is astronomically high. And by the way, 11% is the right number. This is according to Jerome Powell as well. Why is that different than the Bureau of Labor Statistics number of, I believe it was maybe even high fives or low sixes. The reason is once somebody stops looking for work, they no longer count them as unemployed. So there has been a huge amount of losses with women and some of those women are mothers. And so at, after looking, 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 looking and only getting offered maybe a, a job that would be a gig job that would pay them far less than they were making, what we're seeing is that they're choosing just to take care of the children because someone's got to anyway. So they are no longer counted as unemployed. Back to the asset bubble chart real quickly. So again, um, existing home prices higher than ever. I'll show you the unaffordability chart in just a moment. <clears throat> Dow is very close to higher than ever. The all-time high was uh, 29,500 and change. The NASDAQ higher than ever. And debt is absolutely astronomical. Now, what I the reason I keep January 2020 in here is so that you can compare it because these numbers were already astronomical before we hit the pandemic. And now, you know, we had to print up another, um, you know, three and a half trillion dollars. Four, tri you can see here, it's actually four trillion since January. So, what does this mean to you? Well, when stock prices are too high and real estate prices are too high, there's usually a pull for them to come down. Now, you might say, well, you're saying that. How do I know that's real? Well, let's look at the data. And now we'll go back to that other chart that I was showing you. So this is from Adam Data, and they are just measuring a bunch of cities across the US to see if they're affordable or not. So anything that's under 100 means that it's not affordable. And then when you go and see here, are wage earners qualified to buy? So the only two places where people can really afford to buy on this chart are in Texas, Houston, Texas. It looks like that's it. So you can see here, like if it takes more than 27% of your income to buy a house, that's technically unaffordable. So in all of these cities listed here, they're unaffordable. In New York, it would take more than your income to purchase. In uh, California, in Los Angeles, 70% of your income would go towards buying a home. In uh, San Diego, 65%. So, and you know what's kind of interesting here is that we've seen the amount of homes for sale in San Francisco double year over year. We've seen home prices in New York City have already got dropped by 10% and they're still very unaffordable. So again, when you hear that home prices are unaffordable, what they're not saying is that they're overpriced. I think it's an important thing if you are a, an existing homeowner, rather than thinking, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm not gonna be rich. Maybe I'll pull some money out and buy something else. And a realtor will be very happy to give you that advice. Be cautious. I actually have a blog, Feeling Equity Rich, here's a 10 point checklist to make sure it's not a fleeting feeling. Again, all you have to do to locate that, it's free. And we also talk about it in the real estate section of the ABCs of money. So if you're on my blog uh, and you go to the first blog that's mentioned, at the end of that blog, I list previous blogs. And all you have to do is look for the one about equity rich, or you can even just do a quick find on it. You could do equity and see what pulls up. There, right, the first thing that comes up is feeling equity rich. And again, I do blogs two or three a week. So this might be one month old. It's not that old, even though it looks like it's far down the list. So we're still in the recession. The NBR officially declared it June 8th, 2020. They haven't declared that we're out of it yet. 
is your bank a junk bond would be a good one to read. Five red flags of a financial implosion, another good one to read. Now, let me see if there's anything else on my list that I wanted to show you. The apple gap down you already saw. Oh, this is what I did want to show you. So this is the Great Recession. And what happened is even <clears throat> the market high was October of 2007. Now, in um, April of 2007, we started seeing a lot of mortgage uh, bankers and banks going belly up. And so I started warning about that, but the markets went ahead and went up after all that. And everybody said, oh, oh, it's only limited to the mortgage banking sector. And then we started seeing weakness after October because people started realizing the insiders, remember the insiders are always gonna move first. They started saying, well, we're seeing signs of weakness in Bear Stearns. And then Bear Stearns starts showing signs of weakness and real signs of weakness. And they don't give you warning of that and the markets fall. And then people say, oh, 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 but it was just Bear Stearns. That's it, it was just Bear Stearns. And by the way, the people, when I say people, politicians, the treasury secretary, the federal reserve board chairman. In fact, this federal reserve board chairman has been more transparent and honest than I've ever heard one be. Uh, of course, he's mostly doing this to insiders. You can read about these if you go to federalreserve.gov and read his speeches or his testimonies. He's, he's testifying in Congress. He's being very honest about it. Um, and more honest than I've heard a lot of people. So be careful because when they get trotted out for the media, they might truncate all of the, the truth and the transparency into one sound bite that sounds like we had the best GDP growth in third quarter ever, right? So you want to be kind of stop listening to the media noise, which can be very misin misinformation and start knowing where to find the real data, the real testimony, the real truth. There's more to come. So then we had a lot of backdoor meetings about the banks. So they started selling off, but you didn't get notice of it until Lehman Brothers declared bankruptcy. And that was a gap down. We already talked about what gap down means. And then what happened is we started needing to bail out the auto industry. And this was when George Bush was still in office, even though he was now a lame donkey been le elected out, they gave them some backdoor deals so that the auto industry would have to declare bankruptcy on Obama's watch. And the bottom happened right around the time that they declared bankruptcy in March of 2009. Now, when the auto manufacturers declared bankruptcy in March of 2009, most people thought we were in an apocalypse and that's when a lot of people sold. And that was the exact moment when you might've been buying. Now you might say, well, how the hell do you know, right? And you don't. And that's why annual rebalancing is your buy low, sell high plan on autopilot. Because as your slices get thinner, you buy more low. As your slices get fatter, you sell high. And you don't do this all the time. And you don't constantly watch the news. You do it one time a year or two or three times a year. Not less than once a year, not more than three times a year. Okay. And again, you can learn about that in the stocks section of the ABCs of Money and also in the annual rebalancing blog. So in short, are we going to have a Santa rally? Oh, I do have a few more things about why it's priced in. I hope I can find these easily, this chart easily. Hang on. I think there's, yes, this is it, the CAPE ratio. So the only, this is put together by Robert Schiller. He won the Nobel Prize for this contraption. It's basically, uh, what he does is he takes a 10 year average of the price to earnings ratio. So it kind of factors in any financial engineering that companies do, which is, I think that all the CEOs in the S&P 500 today are more financial engineers than product geniuses. We certainly saw that at Boeing. Um, I could show you the charts of the revenue losses at airlines and casinos and travel industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're down 80 to 90% in revenue. And this, the third quarter wasn't any better. 
So there is a huge drag on the economy. It's not going to be crowed about by the incumbent, obviously, but you need to know about it. And it doesn't mean that we can't recover from this or that we're in an apocalypse or that you should go all to cash. That recovery since March shows you that a balanced plan is better. We are overweighting 20% safe right now because we are in a recession. So if you're 50 and you overweight 20% safe, you only have 30% at risk. If you lose half, it's 15%. So the pie chart itself is what protects you from recessions and also allows you to have game on for the bull markets and the four hot slices increase your performance. It's a simple plan, easy as a pie chart, and it's worked now in the 21st century at a time when most people are losing more than half of their wealth in both of the last two recessions. They lost 35% in March and everybody's feeling a little complacent. I would not. We still have time to go. The average recession takes 18 to 24 months to recover. We have very high prices. Again, the feds and the, um, the Federal Reserve Board kind of pushed money into the system to try to keep prices where they are, but they're too high. They're unaffordable. So I'm going to take you back. I showed you on the housing. And by the way, that's more than half of the of the cities in the US. The house prices are too high for the people who live there. I'm going to show you stock prices and explain this chart to you now. So the only two times, so watch the green line. The red line is long-term interest rates. So in, you're going to be looking at this green and blue line. And if you look at it, and again, this was done in uh, October 4th, you'll see that stock prices right now, the only two times in history where they were higher was in 2000 before the dot-com recession when the NASDAQ lost 80%, 78%, and in the Great Depression. That should be concerning to you. The average price to earnings ratio is 16. So we've seen FANG stocks be super hot, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Nvidia, and Google, very hot. But they have, and Zoom and Beyond Meat, but their price to earnings ratios are astronomical. Some of them are like Zoom, I think is oh, 700. Um, you know, Netflix is 99. They're just too high. So, be cautious because stock prices are too high, real estate is too high, and bonds are illiquid and ne negative yielding. What do you do in that world? You keep a percent equal to your age safe, you overweight safe, you slice up the at-risk portion into 10 funds and have four of them be hot funds, things that might go up if the markets go down or might quickly recover, more quickly recover. Um, and that is a good plan that you don't have to be stressed out about. You don't need a PhD in economics to do. And if you don't know what you own right now, and if you were nervous in March, then please consider getting a second opinion. Just call 310-430-2397 or email info at nataliepace.com. I can mock up a pie chart of what you have mock up a pie chart of a better plan, and then outline an action plan so you know exactly what to do to get safe, protected, hot, and diversified. I would do that now. I would not wait until the election, although it's only a few days away. I would do it now. And um, I would also, even if it's after the election, look, moves can happen and gap downs can happen, but it's rare for the markets to drop. Again, it took even four weeks for it to drop 35% in the fastest amount of time that it went from a bull to a bear. So, um, just, you know, don't freak out and like, oh my God, I'm not going to get it before the election, but do it now. It does, it, th these problems and challenges are there no matter who gets elected. And if you wanna know which, um, what stocks do better under Republicans or Democrats, then read the blog. I show you the statistics on that. You can see which two presidents were the top performing and they were in the 20, uh, well, actually one of them was in the 20th century, one was in the 21st century. And you can see which uh, pres two presidents were the worst performing. One was in the 21st century and one was in the 20th century. 
So it's, it's kind of revealing, it's worth it. It doesn't take that long to read it, maybe five, 10 minutes. Um, and I, one other thing, if you are interested in the January retreat, consider registering by Halloween because anybody who registers by Halloween and pays the full price is gonna get a free private prosperity coaching session valued at $300. So we can go over things uh, personally for you. If you want a second opinion, it might take two, three coaching sessions on average. I usually say three on average. Um, if you have 100 pages of holding, it's gonna take more than that. If you have one page of holdings, it might take less than that. So um, again, if you want additional information, on any of this, the best place to go is to go to nataliepace.com. So on the homepage, what you'll find is links to our links to everything. Link to personalize your own pie chart free. Of course, it's going to make more sense to you after you read the stock section of the ABCs of money. And, um, and potentially after you come to a retreat where you learn and implement the strategies. If you're interested in the retreat, all of these, all you gotta do is simply click on it in order to go where you need to go. Click on this and it takes you over to the retreat page. You can learn the prices, um, it's online so you don't have to travel anywhere. And that makes it the most, it's the most affordable retreat. By the way, if you want to bring your partner or a friend or a colleague or a family member, then they're going to pay $350. You guys can just split it. So $350 for the second person. If you put together a group, the fifth person is only paying $99. These are early bird prices, okay? So the early bird price ends November 30th. The free gift deadline ends Halloween. If you bring someone with you, they get the lower price instead of the free gift. That's their free gift. Also, the ABCs of Money, fourth edition, if you want to get your free copy, just the easiest way to find it is go to nataliepace.com and just click on the book cover and it takes you right over. And as you can see, I've already purchased it, but it's free. And thank you guys. Uh, it was at the number one in budgeting and it was at number one in environmental economics. Oh, it's climbing up in the Kindle store. So. Uh, thank you guys for making it number one in, in budgeting. And that's been for a couple of days now. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so other things here, if you're interested in the Earth Gratitude Project, sustainability, I do cover sustainability and the ABCs of money. If you're somebody who wants to green your portfolio, I actually recommend that you read my afterword first because it talks all about putting your money where your heart is and profiting and why that's so important and also why it's a good strategy. All right, gang, I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate you sticking with me through all this data slog that we just did. And I love having this community. I'm gonna open up the phone lines now. And if anybody would like to have a conversation, let's do it, okay? All right. And yes, please promote the ABCs of Money freebie everywhere. I mean, I honestly wish that high schools and colleges uh, would get it. I want every single person who can to get it while it's free. By the way, it's only like under $5 when it's not free. The Kindle version, we make it affordable for people. But I absolutely scream this one from the rooftops and get it out to everybody who needs it. I think high schoolers can use it. Middle schoolers, it might bore them. They would need, however, the ABCs of money for college because I, I gotta tell you, I have parents of two-year-olds that have started their college fund and really gotten things together by reading the ABCs of money for college. So if you know any uh, parent or tween or teen um, or school, or even a college student that's already in college, it's a good idea. And anybody is considering getting a graduate degree. Um, and do remember that there is a deadline that the ABCs of money is only free through Halloween. Okay. Anybody else have anything to say? You can unmute yourself. 
All right, thank you guys. And thank you for being part of our community. I think it's gonna be really valuable for all of us because my goal over the next few years is to start, and by the way, we've already been doing it. Oh, I do have to share one quick thing with you, okay? So when you take charge and get control of your money, it's life transformational. So let's say for instance, that you go to the earth gratitude thing and you click on it and it takes you over to earthgratitude.org. You can actually watch a video of uh, a four minute film about you know sustainability, greening your portfolio, using modern portfolio theory and our easy as a pie chart and stake strategies, but also learning about investing in real estate from Alvin Tam. It's four minutes that's really worth watching. Um, so I strongly encourage you to do it. But the bottom line here is that Alvin came to a retreat in 2011. And when we were talking about things, he lived in Vegas and he was starting a family. I said, if I were you, I'd buy a house. He bought a house, it doubled by 2017. At that point, now they had also a yoga studio. They had been on a soul searching journey to Peru. And when they came back, they were having a hard time justifying driving, you know, an hour commute to teach yoga or buying organic food wrapped in plastic. And so they decided to make a bold move to British Columbia and to build their own solar home. And that's their story on that four minute film. The really cool thing is they had doubled their money on that house they bought in Vegas. And so it afforded them to launch into this next chapter of their lives to raise their son. So what I'm telling you is when you keep your money, when you know how to earn money while you sleep safely, not just having blind faith that somebody else is doing, for it, doing it for you, then you're able to start greening your life. It doesn't happen like an instant because there's, it, let's face it, even those of us that care a lot about sustainability and maybe are spearheading the sustainability movement, getting carbon zero in your own life is not easy to do. And the more that you empower yourself to have the found financial foundation that you need, to have the financial wisdom that you need, because a lot of people think that they're great at sustainability. And not only are they not leading a carbon neutral life, most of them are investing in the very polluters that they pick it. They're profiting from polluters. They don't know what they own. They let somebody else manage it, or they have a pension or an annuity or life insurance. And they don't know that all of that, if you don't green it yourself, goes into the status quo. So if you want to live a green life, there is no other way than to become get the ABCs of money that we all should have received in high school. It's not getting a PhD in economics. It's really easy. And it does, once you learn it, it becomes the foundation of your life. And then one to three times a year, you rebalance your nest egg. You purchase real estate, not at an all time high. That can be held for a decade if you do. You purchase real estate when it's an opportunity. So again, we are forming more communities. We're starting investment clubs. We are starting real estate investment clubs. And our goal is to have a strong community of empowered, enlightened, informed, green investors. Look, I, I'm not, and I'm not excluding people anymore. It used to be that if I, I said that there might be some people who didn't believe in climate change. I'd say now the statistics are about 77% of Americans not only believe in climate change, but believe that we are not doing enough to counteract it. And that includes a lot of uh, conservative Republicans. So um, we have a lot more in common than our political parties would allow us to realize. So thank you again for being a part of this community and for, your, for becoming the enlightened warrior of the light that we all need. I'll see you soon. It's the Kindle version that's free. Yeah, Alvin's video is amazing. You gotta watch it. Bye-bye.